Okay, so uh, welcome to this uh, SHRA masterclass on PAS 2035, what it did, what it means for me. Um, so the idea of the session today is to uh, go through sort of uh, to demystify some of the uh, some of the framework structures that PAS works to. So it's to apply that, how you might apply that to an SHDF bid or um, for a project as you're mobilizing it. So uh, my name's Ben Bright. I'm a senior consultant at TNT. Um, my background is in sort of retrofit delivery. I'm a retrofit coordinator. Um, and before joining TNT, I was the commercial manager for an insulation business. So I sort of took projects all the way through from um, from survey all the way through to sort of final delivery as well. So. Um, so start with the sort of basics, I suppose. Um, what is PAS 2035? So what and what does PAS stand for as well? So PAS itself stands for a publicly available specification. Um, and what they're used for is when uh, government need to put um, something into law, but they haven't got the time to go through the kind of due process. So they use the PAS framework to to apply that concept to the specific industry that they're working under. Um, PAS 2035 and PAS 2030 are the retrofit focused PAS frameworks um, and PAS 2031 manages the process of certification to PAS 2030. So 2035 applies to the whole sort of uh, retrofit piece. It's the program or the project management of the whole retrofit cycle. And PAS 2035 uh, is the standard that the installers delivering uh, retrofit projects work to. So the purpose of PAS 2035 is to um, is to guide a holistic approach that considers a building as a system of elements, interfaces and occupants that interact and not as a set of elements that are independent of each other. So the idea is that the, the building is considered as a whole um, and each element it looks at how it interacts with the other elements that you may install or you may install in the future to make sure that you work to a right first time principle. Um, there's a sort of significant business case that comes under PAS 2035 and it what it aims to do is reduce the long term risk associated with retrofit by standardizing the approach across the country, um, which means that you're essentially managing that long term risk, making sure that you're doing the right thing for the right property at the right time. Um, so the kind of process is is well laid out within the PAS 2035 document. So this is a, a flow chart which is in in that doc um, and it shows the, the kind of thought process that uh, you apply when working to a, a PAS 2035 project. So you go through your risk assessment phase and then down to your, your dwelling assessment and then you look at your improvement um, options and your long and uh, your medium term retrofit plan and evaluate that and produce a design. And at the bottom it goes through the um, essentially the installation process. So you can see there that PAS 2030 is uh, highlighted within that box. And then post retrofit, it outlines your monitoring and evaluation criteria and how they then apply. So it's important to have an understanding of this flow chart uh, because at the end of the project, if you don't achieve your intended outcomes, um, there are some additional monitoring that's required and you'll have to make remedial action against that. So it'd be really useful to kind of familiarize yourself with that flow chart so that you're aware of the kind of standard uh, process that you'll be delivering your projects under. Um, so the first stage is is kind of the ret the risk assessment. So some of you may be familiar with the the kind of the thought around pathway A, B, or C, but what does that really mean? Um, so within PAS, we assess the risk against five criteria. So the table on the right that you can see here um, outlines what those criteria are, um, and within it, depending on the criteria or the subcategory within that you then apply a risk grade to that particular project. So um, the criteria is quite small, so hopefully you can see it, but it's a uh, number of dwellings in the project is criteria one. Uh, criteria two is the number of measures per dwelling. Criteria, criteria three is the measures that you propose, and I'll go through uh, how those are evaluated in, in, in a short while. Uh, criteria four is the combination of measures that you're putting together. And then criteria five is the built form of the original property. So within that, um, you get an overall risk grade and the way that that is defined is the the highest risk grade for any of those subcategories is then applied to the overall risk. Um, so there are some interesting things that you can do in terms of the, the risk profile and understanding how that works, but it's really important when you're scoping your projects to understand what the implications of the risk pathways are. So the implications are 
that the essentially the risk pathway defines the, the project requirements and that leads into kind of your um, monitoring and evaluation requirements any air tightness testing you might need to do um, and generally the inherent risk of the project um, as you move forward um, the higher the risk the pathway or higher risk the pathway the more in-depth the assessment and design process becomes so if you're working to a, a grade a um, the the requirements for the designer and also the specification that you might draw up uh, are less than if you're working to a pathway c project um, and the, and the higher risk projects, so B and C, um, require higher qualifications of your retrofit assessors and retrofit designers. So I'll run through those again um, in a little bit. Um, so we talk about the inherent technical risk of measures. Um, and it's important to understand what they are. So the, the table on the right here um, outlines the IHT value for each uh, measure that you might be applying, and they're given a number between one and three. Um, and this value quantifies the associated risk within its application to the property. So higher risk measures are given a higher value. So an example is IWI carries with it um, a, um, a high risk of interstitial condensation. So it's a very risky um, product to be applying to a property. So that's given a, a, an IHT value of three. Whereas um, an example would be applying a hot water insulation jacket to a, uh, to a cylinder is very, very low risk in terms of the, the action that it might happen or might give to the property. And therefore that's given an IHT of one. Um, these uh, IHT values can affect the overall risk pathway. So where a retrofit installer operates under an approved industry quality assurance scheme, the IHT score for that measure may be reduced by one. So an example would be if you have, um, you can see on the second line of that table, um, EWI is quantified as an IHT2. If the installer operating under PAS 2035 is approved by the industry or an industry quality assurance scheme, the IHT value can be reduced to one. So the implications of that might be that within the table on the previous slide, um, if your highest risk pathway is to do with the IHT measure um, or the IHT value of the measures that you're applying, that could reduce your overall risk pathway from an example of a B down to an A. Um, so that has a knock on effect um, to the project that you're running. So um, the, the example of that is this criterion three of the risk of the highest measure um, being down by one grade, but it only applies if it's not overwritten by another criteria. So an example would be doing EWI on a number of properties, but if you're installing 30 plus, then that would mean that the inherent or the overall risk pathway would be C as opposed to the impact um, on, uh, on criterion three. So it's important to understand the risks with the measures that you're looking to put forward and the measures you're installing and how they might affect the project overall. Um, so we'll go through some examples on uh, the measures and their associated pathway. So loft insulation is categorized as an IHT2, but it can be downgraded to one if the installer operates under a guaranteed scheme. EWI and windows on a low risk building constructed with masonry cavity walls and installed under an appropriate industry quality assurance scheme is likely to be a pathway A within the framework. But it the, the pathway that you identify um, does have a, an impact on your monitoring requirements. So every PAS project that you do, uh, you must complete your basic monitoring and evaluation. But further monitoring is triggered if the intended outcomes are not achieved. So when you start off your project, you'll set your intended outcomes and it might be things like reducing the heat demand. It might be improving in the, uh, improving the internal comfort. It might be reducing the EPC grade of the or in, yeah, in, um, increasing the EPC score of the property. Um, so at the end, once you've done your fit, um, you then check that against it and basic monitoring is a sort of questionnaire with the resident and to make sure that there's no um, presenting damp or mold or any other issues that have been identified and if you achieve those then the project can be signed off but if not you have to go back and sort of if you think back to the flow chart um, go back through that process and create remedial action and do some further monitoring um, and if, if you can't resolve it, you then may meet, need to move from intermediate into advanced monitoring um, to understand what's going on and uh, to, to kind of rectify any issues that presenting. So kind of on to retrofit assessments. So once you've done your risk assessment, you've got an idea of the, um, the project that you might be proposing, but what you don't have is a necessarily a detailed stock condition survey. So that's what essentially what retrofit assessments are. Um, and they are done 
well they're, they're undertaken once the risk assessment has been completed um, and they don't need to be done prior to a funding application so within wave one of the shdf there was no stipulation to have uh, retrofit assessments completed for the properties you were putting forwards um, who does them uh, so generally they're done by a retrofit assessor or a retrofit coordinator and they must be somebody who's gone through either of those qualifications and they must be somebody who's suitably skilled within that region so depending on the risk pathway there is a requirement for um for skills uh, background skills for those retrofit assessors and coordinators um, and they can have a major impact on your shdf bid so they collect an accurate picture of the current property condition and are used to inform the retrofit design once you get to that stage. Um, and the assessment and design process can alter the assumptions made during a desktop exercise. So you may have EPC information for properties and you may have modelled it through various modelling softwares. Um, but once you get on site, there may be other um, unexpected um, conditions that mean that the project that you may have put forwards may have to be adjusted based on that retrofit assessment. So when it goes through the design stage, um, the retrofit designer will propose the right measures for the right property at the right time. Design itself um, can have a can have an impact on on your retrofit program. Um, so certain property characteristics can in, impact what measures are most appropriate, um, and they can have an effect on your SHDF project, altering those most appropriate measures. So an example could be that. Um, you may be putting forward a project um, of EWI, but once you get out to site and you do your retrofit assessment, um, it actually shows that EWI is not, not necessarily possible because there's not enough access to the external perimeter of the property, and therefore you may have to switch to insulating internally. So it's important to understand that those assessments may adjust um, your funding bid. Um, and during the design phase, it has to be done by a retrofit designer um, and different pathways have different requirements for that designer. So um, a single measure pathway A project can be designed by a suitably qualified system designer. So that might be a representative from an EWI company. It might be um, the same from an IWI company or, a, um, or an air source heat pump uh, installer. They can provide a, a design for that. When you move up to risk pathway B, um, on non-traditional buildings, it can be designed by a retrofit coordinator with no prior qualifications. So that could be anybody who's essentially gone through that retrofit coordinator course. Um, but when you go to risk pathway B on traditional buildings or above, so moving into risk pathway C, they must be designed by an architect, a CIOB member or an RICS member. And that's down to the risk that the project poses. So you need to make sure that when you're designing your retrofit projects, you're doing it with the right or the adequate skill set to, to back up the decision making that you're putting forwards. Um, so within the retrofit design, there's a few elements that are included. Um, the first is the, the retrofit design document itself, and that includes your measure design, your overall design and any construction details which are relevant to the um, project that you're conducting. Uh, you need to produce a ventilation design or a ventilation strategy um, and that must be adequate for the dwelling and must take into account the opposite occupancy and property condition um, because the number of occupants within the property can have a distinct impact on the um, on the ventilation required because of the moisture produced during sort of day to day activity. Um, you set your intended outcomes, so they um, they're important for your kind of monitoring process that we mentioned before, and they set out what the project hopes to achieve, um, and they're different for each project or property because each one has an individual requirement. And also, you sort of finalise your risk assessment, uh, which defines the risk pathway for the project into A, B, or C against the criteria within the PAS twenty thirty five document. Okay, so. Um, Within the design process, uh, on the right here, you can see the interaction matrix. So this matrix again is within that is within the PAS 2035 document and it out, outlines uh, how individual elements that you might apply to a property um, correlate against each other. So it allows the measure or the designer to see um, which measures are essentially complementary with each other. Um, green within that table are measures that don't interact and therefore can be installed quite easily. Um, yellow are ones that connect physically, so you need to be mindful of, of how they're going to interact. Um, orange are elements that might interact in, in, in other ways. And then red are products that are entirely sort of incompatible with each other and shouldn't be installed um, together. Um, within the design, the measure design can often be provided by a product uh, or system supplier, but with oversight from the retrofit coordinator. Um, 
but it must still be produced by a suitably qualified designer overall and projects with the higher risk have higher requirements of that designer that we mentioned before. Um, but one of the key things that must also always be included is the construction detailing and particularly the junctures between measures and they must be properly designed and considered. Um, and junctions and seals are critical generally within retrofit projects as well to make sure that you're achieving your air tightness values and you're mitigating any risk that might uh, present with kind of condensation or damp or mould at those junctures. Um, so we move on to kind of the ventilation design. Um, why is ventilation important? Um, well, it's important that pollutants and moisture are removed from the property um, to maintain good internal air quality. So that's for kind of healthy homes, really. Um, when you're designing your ventilation system, you need to consider um, a certain set of things, and this is all detailed within the, the PAS 2035 document. So a ventilation system is considered inadequate if, the, uh, if, the, if it has any of the following. So any evidence of condensation or mould growth is present within the property. Um, if no ventilation system is present or it's incomplete, uh, there are no undercuts to internal doors and that is uh, defined as a 10 millimetre above the floor finish and they're important to allow sort of air to pass through the property um, and no provision of purge ventilation in each habitable room. So if, it me if, it, if any of those present, then the current ventilation system is, uh, uh, is seen as inadequate. Um, when you're designing your ventilation system, the air tightness value post works is, is important. You need to make sure that um, it can operate to its intended use um, over um, or, or draw in enough air around that air tightness value. Um, you must also consider the long term property objectives outlined in the medium term retrofit plan. So, for example, you want to make sure that uh, long term that ventilation system is going to be adequate to overcome the air tightness that might be done at a later date. So an example might be uh, if you uh, if there's a, a plan to put, put some EWI on the property later, then you need to make sure that the ventilation system um, can overcome that value, um, particularly for, to kind of fit to the right first time principles that are needed. Um, and then lastly, you need to consider the occupancy um, and make sure that the ventilation system is, is going to be adequate enough to, to draw out the moisture that might be, um, that is put into the air by the occupants themselves. OK, so how does ventilation kind of affect your project? Um, so any measure that changes the air tightness of the property requires a consideration to the effect on ventilation. So every essentially every project that's put forwards, um, you need to consider the ventilation requirement within it. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's a new ventilation system is required, but you must make sure that adequate ventilation is in the property post fit. So kind of how does that apply to potential projects? So if you have a, an EWI, an IWI, a uh, windows or floor insulation in isolation, the air tightness will increase within the property. And these projects are likely to require continuous mechanical extract ventilation in all wet rooms and correctly sized background ventilators in living spaces and bedrooms. So that means that essentially you need mechanical extract ventilation in your kitchens and bathrooms um, and your background ventilators are um, sort of core vents or trickle vents on windows to make sure that um, an adequate supply of fresh air can be drawn in through that ventilation system. Um, if you were looking to sort of do a cavity fill in, in isolation, um, it's likely to require intermittent extract ventilation um, within those wet rooms and again suitably sized background ventilators in, in living spaces and bedrooms as well. OK, the final part of the process within PAS is once you've completed the retrofit um, is to make sure that you're lodging the information onto um, the, the Trustmark data warehouse. So within that lodgement, you need to include a few things. Uh, so the first is the documentation for all measures installed, including the guarantee information for that measure. Uh, you need to show your claim of compliances from both the retrofit coordinator and the installer. So the retrofit coordinator will sign a document to say they've delivered the program or the, or the project uh, to the PAS 2035 standard and the installer will do the same for PAS 2030. Uh, you need to supply your handover documents which are given to the occupant and they explain the works that have been done, what the outcomes are and how some of the new um, systems might be used or operated if they need to. Uh, you need to supply your sort of pre-fit building condition information. So that is your retrofit assessment and any site information that you, you take. Um, your overall stock condition information. 
and then finally your intended outcomes which you set at the start of the project so within the claim of compliance you're saying that um, we've delivered it and the intended outcomes have been achieved within the project and that is all lodged within the Trustmark um, data warehouse and it can be accessed at any time and uh, checked against those uh, checked against those lodgements as well so that's the kind of uh, the overall process of PAS 2035 in a bit of a snapshot. So I hope that's been useful. But um, yeah, any questions you may have, we'd obviously be happy to take them.